Welcome. Uh, my name is Stephen Kimber, and I am the interim director of the School of Journalism here at King's College. And I just want to say uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this 10th annual Joseph Howe Symposium. And I want to welcome not only those of you in the audience, but those of you out there in that world of live stream television who are watching us from all over the place, I'm hoping. Um, as I said, this weekend is, uh, we're going to talk about investigative journalism, why it matters. Given the fact that during the 10 years that we've been doing this, we have uh, tackled subjects like truth and the future of news, I don't expect this is going to be a tough one, uh, why investigative journalism matters. We have great speeches, or great uh, panels, uh, great speakers, and I'm not going to preempt uh, the introduction of those people, but I do want to say a couple of quick thank yous. One is to uh, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research here at King's, uh, which is co-sponsoring this event as part of a series of lectures called uh, Journalism in the Public Square. Uh, some of you may remember that we had uh, a session in the summer with uh, journalist Ian Brown that was a spectacular evening. Uh, and we will have uh, at least one more before the end of the year. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you will uh, find out soon enough. Um, I also want to say thank you uh, to my colleague Fred Valance-Jones. Uh, when we talk about why investigative reporting matters here at King's, we essentially talk about Fred. Uh, he arrived at King's in 2007, and I remember him talking about establishing a center of excellence in investigative and data journalism here, and he didn't waste any time. Uh, he started with a summer institute that we have each summer that's professional development. Uh, his undergraduate investigative workshops uh, win awards on a, a regular basis, not only student awards for investigative journalism and journalism generally, but uh, in the mainstream media as well. We, we do very well, thanks to uh, Fred and his uh, team of student uh, investigative journalists. Uh, and he's also one of the driving forces behind our new Master of Journalism program, uh, the Investigative Stream. Uh, and so I just really want to uh, say thank you to Fred because this weekend would not have happened without the, the work that he did in getting uh, people here and, and organizing this event. I'm going to let him uh, introduce the rest of the program to you. Thank you very much. Fred. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for those very kind words. And welcome everybody here in Alumni Hall, and as uh, Stephen said, uh, I suppose potentially around the world. So wherever you are, uh, welcome to the 2013 uh, Joseph Howe uh, Symposium. So I was going to introduce myself, but Stephen has done a really, really good job of that. So I'm going to jump right to the content here. And we think investigative journalism is really, really important here at King's uh, because really it's the journalism that perhaps more than any other is sort of the lifeblood of democracy. And I, I, I don't suppose we have to look very much farther than Ottawa and, and folks like you're going to hear from tonight. Uh, does, you know, when you realize that this entire uh, Senate scandal wouldn't have happened without journalists on the job using investigative techniques. And uh, you're going to hear a lot about that over the next uh, couple of days. We all know, though, that investigative journalism, uh, at least as practiced by traditional media, has been facing some tough times. Uh, we've seen a lot of specialized reporters leave. We've seen newsrooms shrinking. Uh, and we've also seen sort of the arrival of what you might call the 24-hour news cycle, and sort of the 140-character story. And some sort of wonder, well, you know, can you, uh, can you reconcile the 140-character tweet with the large investigative project? Well, there have been some people trying to do something about that. And one of the things we've seen, of course, is you know, here at King's, we, we run our investigative workshop, and it's become a sort of a local investigative institution. We have the Coast here, which is doing a lot of tremendous uh, investigative work. And Tim Bosque is sitting over here. He's going to be uh, talking to you tomorrow about his Michener Award uh, nominated in CAJ, top award-winning piece on Peter Kelly. 
So there's people who are out there who kind of keep this, this, this light alive. And we also have people, you know, who are developing new ideas uh, in terms of investigative journalism. So we have foundations that have become very big in the United States, ProPublica, for example. And tomorrow we're going to hear from Suzanne Reber from the Center for Investigative Reporting in California, where they're doing remarkable sort of digital multimedia investigative work. So even though we're facing these challenges, there are some really amazing things happening that are sort of keeping the light of investigative journalism not only alive, but I think in many ways it's thriving in ways that it hasn't, hasn't before. Now, of course, tonight we're going to focus on these, uh, these two guys, uh, Glenn McGregor and, uh, and, and Stephen Marr. Uh, and they uh, are, of course, uh, work out of the press gallery in Ottawa. And in a moment, uh, Tim uh, Curry, my colleague, will introduce the panel. Um, but I want to take just a moment and I want to talk about the guy who kind of started it all. This guy who's up here behind me in this little uh, pencil sketch. Probably all the journalism students in the room are pretty familiar with Joseph Howe, and most Nova Scotians, I think, are not only familiar but proud of, uh, of, of Joseph Howe. But back in 1835, when, when electricity was something that, you know, wasn't even something people imagined yet, really, uh, and, and Twitter and so on were like a century and a half uh, away and two centuries away before we're going to see this sort of thing. Uh, Joseph Howe had a newspaper called the Nova Scotian, which was quite an institution here. And one day, uh, a letter to the editor in 1835, I think it was New Year's Day in 1835, was published. And this, this letter, let's just say that it was, uh, this letter was not your usual letter to the editor, and it was believed by most, of course, that it was uh, approved, shall we say, by, by Mr. Howe. And it, it made some allegations about the local magistrates, some investigating report, investigative reporting of its day, the local government of its day, suggesting 30,000 pounds or so of uh, funds had been kind of uh, embezzled and so on by these uh, uh, and extorted by these uh, magistrates. So they weren't too happy and in the day uh, they had something called criminal libel which was uh, on the books and you could be uh, you could be charged with a criminal offense and that's exactly what happened and so uh, with uh, not much uh, delay Mr. Howe was dragged before the court to answer and and he had, he had gone to a couple of lawyers in town and and asked them you know well, well you know can you defend me in this thing and they said, they said look it's a slam dunk you're going to be convicted uh, there had been a case about 30 years before uh, that had seen uh, another person convicted and, and it was expected that he would go down too. In fact, so much so that at the trial, as I understand it, the Crown brought one witness basically to say, yep, the, the libel occurred guilty. Uh, but Mr. Howe decided that he would, rather than uh, trust these local lawyers, he was going to like run his own defense. And so that's exactly what he did. So he got up before the, uh, the court, and this is down where the Legislative Library is today. So if any of you are down Province House, down there where the Legislative Library now used to be the court. And he got up for what, what I think was about six hours in his own defense. And I'm just going to quote a couple of words from Mr. Howe before I finish. So he says, your verdict will be the most important in its consequences ever delivered before this tribunal. And I conjure you, conjure you to judge me by the principles of English law and to leave an unshackled press as a legacy to your children and to these guys. You remember the press in your hours of conviviality and mirth. Oh, do not desert it in this day of trial. And he went on, yes, gentlemen, come what will, while I live, Nova Scotia shall, not, shall have the blessing of an open and unshackled press. But you will not put me to such straits as these. You will send me home to the bosom of my family, and so on. Well, it didn't take the uh, jury more than a few minutes to acquit him. They said, well, to heck with that. And that was really the beginning of the end of criminal libel. We still have libel today, but at least today we have the, not only the defense of truth, we also have now a defense of responsible journalism, which might have been what Howe was arguing for, in that even if you make a mistake, if you did the job thoroughly, that is now a defense you can use in a trial of defamation. Now, I'll leave the rest of the details on that to my able colleague, Dean Job, who's the true authority on such matters. But we can't have a Joseph Howe symposium without a, a nod to, uh, to Joseph Howe. So now I'm going to give a nod to my colleague, Tim Curry, who's going to, uh, to introduce uh, the moderator of our panel and get uh, the, the substantive events of the evening underway. Good evening, everyone. 
Uh, our host for this evening is the Globe and Mail's Jane Tabor. She's going to moderate the panel with our guests, Glenn McGregor and Stephen Marr, on their coverage of the robocalls affair and other stories. Jane is the Globe and Mail's Atlantic Bureau Chief. She has covered a multitude of stories in the region, from investors making bets on rural Nova Scotia to chanting St. Mary's University students. Her extensive experience in national political reporting has greatly added to the coverage of Atlantic Canada. Jane has been with the Globe and Mail since 2002. She has spent most of her career covering politics on Parliament Hill, first with the Ottawa Citizen, the National Post, and then the Globe. For nearly seven years, Jane was also the co-host of CTV's Question Period. She and Craig Oliver, CTV's chief political correspondent, grilled politicians about the issues of the week every Sunday morning. After 25 years of writing about politicians, covering election campaigns, and numerous leadership battles, she wanted to try something different. The opportunity in Atlantic Canada came up, and she relocated to Halifax in February of 2012. Jane is married to a Haligonian, and she and her husband have two children. Welcome, Jane Tabor. Thanks, uh, thank, thank you very much, Tim, and uh, thanks for, for all of you coming here. And this promises to be a spectacular night, better than Ian Brown's night, I have to say, to, uh, to Stephen Kimber. And uh, I, I did flee Ottawa a few, uh, almost a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. I'm kind of sorry I did right now, given what's happening in the Senate. So before we talk about Pam and Mike, no, I'm sorry. Um, let me introduce, uh, <laughs> let me introduce uh, our two guests, two, two gentlemen who I worked with in the hot room. It's called the hot room. It's in the, uh, the center block of the, of the parliament buildings. And uh, because of the work that Glenn and Steve did, they were nicknamed McMar, sort of like uh, Bragelina or whatever, or... Uh, or uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. And they, they are the hotties of the hot room. I have to tell you that as well. Um, Which gives you an idea of the standard in the hot room. <laughs> Honestly, look how cute they are. Um, they asked me to, to say that. Um, yeah. We all have Halifax connections. I was dragged here by a Haligonian who complained for the whole time that we were married. We'd been married 28 years and he just couldn't stand Ontario. So we moved here and I'm, I'm kind of liking it. I'm, I'm not there yet. Um, Glenn, Glenn McGregor's connection with Halifax is the fact that he was one of the first people who worked for Frank Magazine. And at the time, Frank Magazine was uh, owned by David Bentley, who of course runs all NovaScotia.com now, which every newspaper is envying because he knows how to make money behind a paywall that our, our newspapers haven't figured out. So Glenn has spent an awful lot of time in Halifax helping David when, uh, during those years when he ran Frank Magazine. On the other hand, we've got uh, Steve Marr over here. And uh, Steve, of course, is from Nova Scotia. He's not a Haligoni, he was brought up in Truro. But he went to King's. And he didn't take journalism because they wouldn't let him in. <laughs> he, did, he did foundation year and he took uh, international studies. International development. I'm sorry, international development. And you can see he's uh, helping, helping that way now, helping out to <laughs> Ottawa. Um, and, uh, but he did make it into, into journalism school. But he's here now and he's pleased to be here. So let's talk about the story that they did, the robocall story. It was so significant that they won the triple crown of newspaper awards, a CAJ award, a national newspaper award, and the, um, what was it, and the Governor General's uh, Michener Award, and there are cash prizes that come with those awards. That's pretty, that's almost unprecedented. I don't know of any other stories that have uh, won the Triple Crown like that in, 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 that, in that one year. Um, it was the dominant story of uh, 2012. It, it still continues to reverberate and make headlines. And it's led to a national investigation to more than 1,300 complaints in 200 ridings across the country. Uh, it, uh, it raised public awareness, and this is probably the most important thing because we're talking about democracy here. And it raised public awareness about how the democratic franchise can be compromised, compromised by new technology. So we'll start there. And we're gonna start with how they got the story. Glenn. So, um, well, we'll probably start with Steve talking about how he got because Steve got on the story first, and, yeah, and so uh, several months before I did. I wasn't really interested. It's all about who gets first byline. <laughs> yeah. In uh, 2011, I was still working for the Chronicle Herald. I was the Ottawa bureau chief for the Chronicle Herald. It was a bureau of one, and that was me. I I'm was, the bureau of one, too. I was the chief. Uh, a, a job now uh, held by, some of you may know, Paul McLeod, who uh, 
works in uh, <laughs> works in the hot room now. So uh, the, the Chronicle Herald brought me back from Ottawa to cover the 2011 election, which was not the most interesting federal election in uh, Nova Scotia history. There wasn't the prospect of many seats changing, so the leaders weren't coming here, and I was a, a little bit bored. Um, April 15th, there was a, a, a program on CBC. Um, uh, uh, they did a report out of Toronto, Dave Seglins did a report on uh, some strange things that were happening in uh, Joe Volpe's riding, where he was a, an incumbent liberal who the, the Tories really wanted to take out. They had a prominent uh, uh, candidate running against him, Joe Oliver, who's now the Natural Resources Minister. This is a riding in Toronto that yes. we're talking about. Yeah, yeah uh, Eglinton Lawrence. And the campaign workers and volunteers for Volpe kept reporting that they, they, when they'd be calling their supporters, their supporters would say, stop calling me. Why are you calling me so often? Why are you calling me and being rude? You just called me yesterday. Uh, and so they started to suspect that someone was playing a trick on, on, their, on them and trying to deceive and confuse their voters. This is a dirty trick that happens in the United States fair, fairly often. And the idea is that you pretend to be calling from a campaign so that the people get alienated and decide not to vote. I'm not going to vote for you because you've called me too many times. Um, and I found this, it was the first time I'd ever heard of anything like that happening in Canadian politics. And with time on my hands, I, I kind of started to uh, obsess on it a little bit. Uh, partly because if you think about it, the implication is that someone has hired a room full of people to sit around at telephone calls and do something unethical, something that they shouldn't do. Um, I should say, by the way, that there's no reason to believe that Oliver uh, would have any knowledge or that even anyone on the actual campaign. That's what's one of the things that's challenging about dirty political calls is that it's very, very difficult to figure out who's doing them. Uh, so I got kind of obsessed with that and started to try to think about it and, and try to turn it into a story because there was a report that in uh, Prince Edward Island, a candidate there named uh, Guy Gallant, who uh, was a, a liberal candidate, that there were people calling into that riding as well. I never got a story out of it at that time, but I kept working on it and uh, pursuing it and thinking about it and talking to, to uh, um, sources and I went to Toronto once to do some interviews uh, and eventually I did the the um, smartest thing I did which was convince Glenn to work with me on it. Yeah, I, I didn't really want to get involved. I thought it was going to be a nosebleed and I didn't think we were going to get a story out of it. Uh, I had spent uh, five years almost working on a, a, a story, a related story about violations of election uh, law called the in and out scandal. Uh, probably very few of you have heard of it because um, it was an, it was a scandal that, that uh, really only accountants could love. It was c complicated involving wire transfers of money and uh, it, it did lead to this which was a, a raid on the Conservative Party headquarters by Elections Canada. That was kind of exciting but uh, uh, John Iverson who's a, who I called uh, with our company uh, famously dismissed the story as being a bicycle crash and uh, it, was, it was really demoralizing to me. Uh, and then Steve and I still argue to this day about whether it's, uh, the story was, the in and out story was as significant as the robocalls. Uh, I think Steve's winning that argument. Um, but uh, it did have the effect, I think, of creating the, f the first threads in a narrative uh, that would dog the Conservatives uh, up until this day, which is that they are play fast and loose with election law. And there's, there's more history going back to, uh, on that, that that Stephen Harper, when he was out of politics, uh, famously sued uh, Elections Canada uh, over third party advertising restrictions in a case that uh, was called Harper v. Canada. And uh, his critics love to bring that up every time they can. Uh, but uh, so he had this uh, demonstrated animus towards Elections Canada. Um, and, and so uh, I didn't really want to get involved again. I, I, I thought the, the in and out uh, story was, uh, it was kind of demoralizing the way it ended. And, um, but then something happened, I, I think in the fall of that year, where there were reports of these calls being made into uh, the Montreal riding of an MP named Erwin Kotler. And the calls were suggesting that he was gonna, about to retire and they were, they were presented as a poll, but it really was what we call a push poll. 
It was you ask people questions and you're not really interested in their answers, but you want to communicate information to them through, through, through the questions that you ask. And they're usually nakedly partisan attempts. So I, I started writing about that. And I think it's after that that Steve and I realized that we should maybe start working together on this. And it wasn't until, uh, I guess, January of last year that we really got serious. In January, in, the House, in Ottawa, it was pretty dead on Parliament Hill. There's not a whole lot going on. So we started making phone calls. And uh, we, we used stories like the Dave Seglin CBC story as kind of a jumping off point. And we started to build uh, a little database of uh, writings where, where these things have been reported. And we just shared this, this uh, spreadsheet on Google Docs and we would start calling anybody who was involved in any of these campaigns where, where there had been calls reported. So we'd phone up candidates and um, you know, campaign managers, uh, volunteers, saying, what did you hear? Do you remember anything weird with phone calls? And quite often they did. They had, their stories were, were inconsistent. Uh, they varied a lot. But as we assembled this mosaic of writings, uh, a pattern did kind of emerge. And we started to see that, yeah, something was going on. And the place we heard about the most was in Guelph, Ontario. And I think during the election campaign, there had been, I think on election night, hadn't there been some complaints in Guelph that people were going to were. the wrong polling stations and that sort of thing. I remember I was in Michael Ignatieff's headquarters that night, very depressing night for Mr. Ignatieff, but, uh, and we were hearing those kinds of stories. Yeah, that's right. And, and the, when we did this process, uh, one of the things that we did to sort of figure out which campaigns to, to call was comb through media reports from the time. And there were reports from across the country, here and there, in the local paper saying, oh, there were some strange calls and Elections Canada is warning people or that kind of thing. Um, so and this was the, the process. And it's, I think it's kind of interesting. What the um, reporters in Ottawa now are always complaining about how it's because of the media control style of Mr. Harper and the Conservative Party, it's much more difficult than it once was to figure out what's going on. If you ask them, they say, uh, we're doing great things for the economy, no, no answer. <laughs> so I, I think that this process, what we did here, is interesting, uh, and it's a, uh, it's a good uh, approach to dealing with an organization that is as secretive as the Conservative Party of Canada, is instead of asking the Conservative Party of Canada, you try to think, well, what impact would this have had? Who else would know this? If there were unethical calls, then people will have received them. Let's find those people and ask them. So you're kind of working from the outside in rather than the inside out. Yeah, let's also talk a little bit about the collaboration because you two are unique in that you don't usually see two reporters collaborating. Reporters generally have big egos and uh, it's very difficult to share a story and, cl and, and work you know, collaboratively on a story. So I know these two guys because I've worked with them and I know that they bring different strengths. Glenn, for instance, loves gathering the data and really not talking to anybody but putting together <laughs> databases and that kind of thing. <laughs> whereas, I'm kidding, but, but he's good at that. Um, whereas Steve is the sort of the more gumshoe kind of reporter who knocks on doors and works the phones and, and pulls the strings. Um, I don't mean pull strings, I mean pull st threads of, of different stories to, uh, to get that story together. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, the, there's a, the first time we worked together, I was working for the Chronicle Herald and Glenn was working for The Citizen. And um, uh, I did a, a funny story, I think it was 2008, was it, 2009? on um, uh, economic action plan spending in Nova Scotia. And I did a, uh, I've sort of built a spreadsheet of all the announced spending projects because I'd noticed that an awful lot of things were going into the riding of Central Nova, which is the riding that belongs to Peter McKay. And nothing at all was going into the riding of Peter Stauffer in Sackville Eastern Shore, who's an opposition MP. And I started to think, oh, well, that's funny. Look at that. Look, I guess some economies are going to be more stimulated than other economies. Uh, and I got a decent little story out of it. Um, and, uh, but I, and then I thought, this, someone should do this for the whole country. Somebody should analyze this and see how the money breaks down across Canada. And I knew that I didn't have the computer skills to be able to do that, and Glenn did. 
Yeah, so I, I, so I did all kinds of computer trickery to, in, in order to find out how we could uh, show that these 6,000 projects, and I was speaking to Fred's class about this today, the process of, of taking all these 6,000 projects and putting them on a map and having the, the software generate, and, and that's really what showed us our story was that we could actually qual uh, quantitatively show how these ridings were being hosed. These, not, these opposition writings were, were not benefiting from it. But so I, I think one of the lessons of, for us with the robocalls thing, and, and those stories as well, was that uh, two heads is uh, better than one on these kinds of stories because each reporter has different styles. Uh, I mean, uh, Steve is, is, is fantastic. Uh, he knows everybody. I've lived in Ottawa most of my life, and Steve's only been there s seven years, and he knows probably about 10 times as many people as I do. He's very social, he, he, he uh, goes out to events where, uh, where there's gonna be political people, he knows everyone. I take a different approach, but it works. And, yeah. and it, My point, you yeah, talk to and, people. Yeah, and, and <laughs> actually, it came at one point, Steve accidentally accused me of having Asperger's syndrome yeah. uh, during, during the course of the yeah. thing. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that to my wife and she said, well, yeah, everybody knows that in the family. <laughs> but, uh, and not to say that Steve doesn't have data skills, and I, I can also do interviews too. I'm not. I'm socially functional. <laughs> okay, I, I saw a, I saw a point with Glenn. Okay, let's get uh, let's get back to the robocall story because at at some point, so you're going along really well, collecting the data, going going back to the stories from the election campaign, working the phones, going to different writings, you know, publishing stories, incremental stories along no, the way. No, no incremental sorry. stories. Oh. No incremental. Not like no. Not like Watergate. We thought okay. we were not getting anywhere. And we thought the best case scenario was, we, we wanted to show a pattern. And we thought maybe if we, if we charted all this, we could see that there was some kind of either a geographic pattern to these calls. Or a pattern with the telephone call. Or, or with the companies, companies that, they had, that we knew they hired from their, because their Elections Canada filings are supposed to show uh, who, with the companies that they hired. We thought that might solve it, but it didn't. In and daily journalism, how long were you taking then for this? How long was it taking? About a month, I think. So you had no stories in the paper for about a month, and you're getting We, we would work on other things, you know, like, oh, there's a story, and, and knock off a quick one, and then go back to this. Did you feel after that month that it was time to give up, because you weren't getting anywhere? There had to be some breakthrough. There had to be something that happened that, that yeah. kept you guys going. We started to look at Guelph, because, uh, and it's probably easiest if I just explain that on, on election night in Guelph, or election day in Guelph, at 10.20 something in the morning, uh, a telephone call went out to 7,000 residents. All We didn't know all this then, but we know now that they were all opposition supporters. And it was a recorded bilingual call uh, telling people, this is Elections Canada calling. Due to higher than expected voter volume, your polling station has been moved. Instead of going to the polling station on your voter's card, go to the old Quebec Street Mall voting station. And then uh, the même chose en français. And, and so this created a big schmozzle and, and people got angry, they showed up at the wrong place, they tore up their voting cards, some people. Um, and we knew about that, but what we learned um, from first sources was, oh, Elections Canada is investigating this. That was the first key thing that we found out. The second key thing was investigator Al Matthews, who Glenn was familiar with his work from uh, uh, the in and out story, yeah, he'd worked, on, he'd worked on the Airbus affair, too. That's yeah. where he's better known from, yeah. Um, so then we found out, okay, so that investigator has been up there. Uh, Glenn spoke to someone who uh, had, been, had t uh, been interviewed by him. Right. And then the key thing really was a, a source that we uh, codename uh, Simon de Beauvoir. Um, he had all these really cool code names for, for people because we would talk in this in this communal room where we worked in with other reporters. We didn't want anybody to hear who our sources' names were, so we had all these acronyms and code names, and so yeah. it made it seem really more cloak and dagger than it really was. Um, so, uh, and then this source told us, "Oh, oh yes," and and it's a long story, and we to try to get this person to talk to us, and it was uh, to trust us and to tell us what this person knew. But what this person told us was, yeah, there were some scamps who did this. They used a burner cell phone. They used disposable credit card. And uh, that was when we were really like, oh, OK, we're on to something now. Now we're on to something quite serious. And they also told us the name of the calling firm in Edmonton, which is a company called Rack 9. 
uh, that was the, the target of the Elections Canada investigation. But election, how did you find out that Elections Canada was investigating? Did they tell you? Did you just call up Elections Canada no. and they said no? Elections okay. Canada had a that history then. of never talking to any to journalists, and uh, you know they're accused of leaking all the time, but uh, they were not particularly helpful to us. So uh, we knew this was the, we knew this guy was the head of Rack Nine. His name was Matt Meyer, and you see with all his his, uh, his computers, and he he runs this company that would you could that ran the, the computer servers that you could actually use to make the robocalls. That's all a voice over IP system. Uh, so we, we were focused on him, but all we had at that point was one source, uh, off of, at a background source, who we trusted and we felt their information was right. We didn't think they were lying to us, uh, but we didn't have enough to publish because we couldn't just go with this allegation that this company was under investigation. So we had to keep looking at uh, uh, other ways of, of trying to track track it down to them. And we face creeped the shit out of them. <laughs> yeah, face, we, we got everything. Well, that's, that, was that a Facebook picture? Maybe not. We had all kinds of Facebook pictures of them. Uh, so earlier in, in the project, I had gone over to Elections Canada, and it's a, it's a little known fact. Uh, not too many political journalists knew it at the time, although lots of them do now since the story came up, is that every election campaign, uh, so all the, all the local candidates here in Nova Scotia are required to send all the receipts that they have uh, filed to back up their expense claims, and they get uh, put in uh, these manila file folders in Elections Canada, and you can go in and look at them. And uh, usually it's things like bills for pizza, you know, pizza for volunteers, or the printing of campaign signs. It's all kind of it's kind of boring, but uh, every once in a while they'll put in a phone bill by mistake. Uh, because a lot of the campaigns, they hire uh, uh, mobile, mobile phones for their staff, and what they tend to do, if anybody looks at the printed phone bill, you'll see it's, you know, the, the information about the, the, uh, how much you owe is on the front page, but quite often it's bundled with a list of all your calls. And so we started combing over these, I'll show you what one of them looks like. This thing, this is the, this, these were the calls from the Marty Burke campaign, this, this, that they had accidentally submitted this entire list of phone calls. So we spent, uh, I spent a couple of weeks combing over all those numbers, trying to see who they were phoning, and, I, and, and in many cases actually just calling up the number and asking who it was. Uh, and Which is tricky. Yeah, and we, <laughs> we didn't get anywhere on that. It just, it just didn't uh, click until Steve got this source who said, look at Rack 9. And we went, and went back and looked at the phone numbers, phone numbers again, and sure enough, I don't know how I'd missed this because I'd looked at them a hundred times, but there on election day were two phone numbers to 780 Edmonton, where the company was, and that's Matt Meyer's cell phone number, and that was the number of the company. And at that point, that was kind of our eureka moment, and uh, we knew you, see, you can see the timestamp there, it's 1108, so it's moments after the call goes out. Yeah, and this, this first one here, it looks like that they got voicemail probably, it was a 30 second call. Uh, but then the other one later in the day was longer. So they were obviously talking about how well whatever they had done had worked. And, and so who, who told you about Rack 9? Simon de Beauvoir. Code name, Simon, and, source code name, Simon and, de Beauvoir. And where did you find this person? Um, I don't know that we should probably but cause, talk cause about I think people, yet. I know, but that's, but that's what you need. You we, need one of those kinds of people. You have to work these people over. You just met them in a bar. You, they knew what you were doing. They called you. Like, how, of, how does it happen? Okay, so in this case, uh, part of uh, the, the process of trying to do a story like this is talking to a lot of people who are involved in politics and saying, oh, yeah, 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 well, well here's what I'm working on. We're doing a story. We're looking into uh, sketchy calls in the last election. Do you know anything about that? Just that, asking loads and loads of people in politics over and over again. And eventually someone said, someone in politics said, oh, yes, we know someone, that's right, who may have some information on that. And then it's a matter of saying, well, can you get that person to call me? Well, uh, we can try, but I don't know if, well, really, it would be really a good idea if you could get them to call me. And I, I've actually looked at the email exchanges I'm having with the intermediary. And I'm basically begging and pleading and <laughs> saying, you know, my life is meaningless without this source. And <laughs> while uh, but it works, yeah. Uh, um, and and Simone was a bit shy uh, too. He, yeah, he was he was a, kind of an odd guy too. He was a little uh, nervous about it. Yeah. So so Simone tells you about 
checking out Rack 9, you find, you go back and you find these 780 we did have changes. another source confirming it too. Okay. Yeah, we did. Did so you we just felt, cold call that? Not did you just no, cold call that? No, I googled those that? numbers okay. and found out that we did this. We didn't call it, and but then that's that's what came next because we knew we now knew we had enough information probably to publish a story that was going to be pretty good, and uh, it was going to make it was going to be an allegation story that this is what it looks like here, and, and so we had we decided uh, you know sort of our D day was okay we got to call Rack Nine. And, ask, and at this point, we thought there were two principals at Rack 9. There was the, Matt Meyer, the, the guy that we uh, showed you a picture of, and also another guy named, I think it was Rick McKnight, who later turned out to be fictional. He was, uh, Rack 9 had created him as some kind of corporate identity. He didn't really exist. A sock uh, puppet, yeah. He was kind of a sock puppet, right. So we decided we're going to call them both at exactly the same time on different lines. And, and, the, and the idea was, well, Steve was going to call Matt Meyer, and I was going to call Rick McKnight. And we had a list of questions drawn up because there was things, that part of this was covering ourselves legally because we wanted to be able to put the allegation to them and give them a chance to respond. And that the responsible communication defense that Fred referred to, that's, that's pretty important that you give your target of your story a chance to respond to it. So that was our prime objective. We didn't think they were going to tell us anything. So we both are uh, in the hot room, uh, desks away, and saying we're going to make the call at exactly the same time because we don't want them to have a chance to start comparing notes with each other about our, about our call. We want to get them both on the, on the phone at the same time. So Steve calls Meyer and... Uh, and got voicemail. And got voicemail. And I call what I thought was Rick McKnight. And the person who answers the phone says, it's Matt Meyer. And then I'm like, oh no, all my questions are for Rick McKnight. So I had to improvise and uh, say, you know, we understand you're under investigation by Elections Canada and that they may have conducted a raid at your facility. And he wouldn't say anything, but uh, he didn't deny it either. And then uh, 20 minutes later, he called back and pretty much confirmed everything that we knew. And that was, I think our story was in the paper the next day. Uh, the first of the stories was in the paper the next day, and that would have been that one. Okay, so you published the first story, and everybody on the hill is jealous and trying to knock it down, so there's nothing to it. Bullshit. That's right. Now it's like a bicycle rack. It doesn't mean anything. All that kind of stuff. So then, so then what do you do? Because we, we haven't talked about the main character in this story yet. So, oh, the main character. Oh, yes. well, the main, that happens a little later. The, the next thing that we did was our second day story, which to me, in, in a way, was more, uh, I thought it was significant and important because the first story had, a, had quite a, uh, an, an explosive impact on Parliament Hill. And the, the government is having to come out and communicate about it, saying, well, yes, there are rogue operatives. It's possible, you know, we've had a clean and ethical campaign, but there are rogue operatives. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the immediate consequence of the first story was that the Prime Minister was uh, traveling in, I think, Yellowknife or Calliwood or somewhere like that, and he, was, he had to answer questions on it immediately. It was, it was a big noise, the, the first story. But, so this story, our second story, which uh, we mentioned some of this in the, the first story, but was the pattern story. And thank goodness that we, we were really afraid at some point that we were only going to have a, a pattern story, which would be a story like a uh, pattern of suspicious calls raises questions, you know, it's very, it's, it's a snoozer. Yeah, it's and it, uh, after a month's work, that would really... It would have been a real C minus story. But building on the previous day's story where their response is, well, yes, there may have been some over-enthusiastic volunteers got ahead of us, and this story said, well, it doesn't look like just a question of over-enthusiastic volunteers in one place, because there were similar aggressive and questionable calls in lots of writings. I should say that that gentleman over here is named Mike Sona, and he was, on, on the second day, or, or the first day the story came out, uh, Sun Media identified him as being the culprit behind the calls, and Sun Media, in my view, functions as a communications apparatus for the Conservative Party, so this was essentially pretty much a press release, uh, or, or akin to a press release, and they, they, he was a guy who worked on the Hill, he also worked on the campaign, the Conservative campaign in Guelph, and so he was immediately uh, thrown under the bus, as the, the vernacular goes, and he is now the only person who's been charged. He was, I think, in the spring that he was charged with, with functions? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. 
Okay, well, now I want to hear about Pierre Poutine. Okay, Pierre Poutine, all right. <laughs> because he's one of the, the so, most interesting central characters to so this, the, uh, um, this story. Uh, when Elections Canada had conducted this raid on Iraq 9's offices, and they went in and got all their data and all their, their phone records and all that stuff, uh, we knew, and I knew this from coming to the internet out case, is when, when you do that, uh, you have to get a court order. And in order to get a court order, uh, the investigating officer has to go before either a judge or a justice of the peace and explain why he needs an order uh, to, to, to do this. And, and he, he fills out a form or, or, or gives a statement, a sworn statement called uh, an information to obtain a production order. And in that, he lays out his case. So it took us a couple of days to realize we should probably get this from the Edmonton court uh, where it was executed. And uh, Ryan Cormier, who was a, a reporter at the Edmonton Journal, uh, he faxed it to us uh, one day uh, in the middle of the week, uh, and it's, it started, the document, that's kind of what it looks like at the top, uh, and the document started flowing in on this fax machine. We're standing there reading, it, reading the pages as they come out, and we're kind of going, okay, blah, 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 knew that, knew that, okay, and the next page comes out, yeah, no, this was all stuff we knew. And then, Additional information from Bell stated that their records identified the phone subscriber as Pierre Poutine of Separatist Street, Joliet, Quebec. <laughs> so at this moment, we were both, I think I'm pulling the pages and Glenn's standing next to me, we do this kind of it's, it's like one of those moments in journalism where like the clouds open up for you and you, you just realize you've been handed this once in a career gift. Of chorus of angels yeah, yeah. singing Hosanna. I'm sure we, I don't know if we high-fived or, or embraced in a manly way or, or what, uh, what? I think it's just a triple take. Okay. All right. But at this very moment, question period is going on and the government is still facing, it had just begun. And that day, the opposition is asking very pointed questions about the previous stories and the government is, is not really responding. Um, and then we realized that we would really like to get a, a question in, into question period that day um, so that we can get an answer from the government uh, to, to, to the details that were in this, in this document. And uh, so, um, well, actually, before we started writing it, I went and tweeted. I was so excited by this name, I, I tweeted this. Um, it wasn't cut very mature of me to do that, but... Um, <laughs> and then Steve started writing the story, and, and well, I was indulging myself here. And, and did, it yeah, make, so. it, did it make it under, into questions? So right? yeah, the, and this is probably the most interesting and fun moment I've had in my career in journalism. Uh, we bang out the story, uh, file it to our editors, our uh, excellent, patient, marvelous editors, uh, Andrew Potter and, uh, at The Citizen and Christina Spencer at Post Media. And Glenn goes down, I forget where you went, Glenn, but I went into the house. I, I went down to scrum, well, we got, but, the, but the question was asked, right? Yeah, no, but while, while question period's ongoing, right. and I, I should say, actually, we wanted to get it out during question period. We were also petrified that the Globe and Mail, right. who well, we were, were also going to the Edmonton courthouse, we knew, the Globe, we knew from our guy in, the, in, and this is where it started to get really competitive. Uh, because any advantage we had coming into this was lost because the story was out there. And we knew the, from our, our guy in Edmonton that uh, the Globe also had the same document at the same time. And may actually have had it before us. And so we, we were quite afraid of Jane's colleagues, Daniel LeBlanc and uh, Campbell Clark, uh, and Steve Chase later. But we, you know, uh, we admire them as reporters and we're afraid that they So you're saying that we missed the story, you guys got the story first? Didn't miss it. We just got wow. it a little earlier. No, we did the analysis. <laughs> we did. We did the wrap-up analysis and columns later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, actually, Steve advanced the story significantly at different times. But okay. well, let's, so you're so getting off topic here. I, I want to hear okay, about so how I, you planted a question with the Liberals' opposition. Well, in we question. Know, That's no, why no, I wanted that. No, we didn't. We didn't plant a question. Did, 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 I went into the house. We put the story up, and I'm sitting there uh, with with my phone in my hand, repeatedly checking Twitter to. Look, wait for a link to come up so I can tweet it and send out our story. Uh, so I'm sitting looking down at the opposition MPs on one side and the government MPs on the other and then the story goes and immediately people are retweeting it and retweeting it. It's like my phone is almost getting hot in my hand because it's a, such a bizarre thing, Pierre Poutine. Um, and uh, I see Denis Coderre, uh, who's now running to be mayor of Montreal, uh, gets up and goes back behind the curtains, presumably to do a 
get a question ready in Robert Band, uh, MPD gets up to do the same thing, and then they uh, come back and you can, uh, okay, maybe they're gonna ask the question. Meanwhile, on the government side, I see Peter Van Loan take out his Blackberry, read this, hand it to the Prime Minister. <laughs> the Important Prime Minister of Canada is sitting there reading the story without, uh, does not, he'd be an excellent poker player because he didn't, uh, he wasn't like, oh my gosh. <laughs> is, the air boutique. Yeah. And then they asked the, the questions and so it got, kind of got the story out. Right. It's good to get, and we were actually uh, criticized or questioned about put, dropping a story during question period by uh, um, uh, Norman Spector, who's a knowledgeable sort of media critic, thinking that it was sort of inappropriate. But there's, you want your stories to be in question period in part because then all, every other news organization can cover the same story, hanging it on question period, right? They, and if that's the only thing that Norman Spector has to criticize about your story, I really wouldn't, I really wouldn't worry about well, it. He had the other concerns, yeah. believe me. But that, that's a, a separate topic for another. So you get Pierre, you get Pierre Putin out there. The prime minister's reading your story. You, you're forcing them to respond, and then then what happens? Because we still don't know who Pierre Putin is. Well, yeah, and and one of the people. This was interesting because Guelph, we haven't really talked about Guelph, but anybody ever been there to Guelph? It's a, it's a lovely little town. Uh, it's kind of a, got a hippie vibe, but it's, a, it's basically a university town. Uh, and it turns out that, and we didn't know this at the time, I think another reporter figured this out, was that there is in Guelph uh, a, a student hangout called Pierre's Poutine. And the gentleman named Pierre, uh, his last name I forget. Uh, from Joliet, Quebec. And he's from Joliet, Quebec. So suddenly it looks like, oh, somebody stole the, this idea for this name from the place that they probably went uh, after the bars uh, in, in Guelph. It's a clue. That's what you call a clue. Okay, so, you, uh, okay, yeah, all right, okay, good fun story. Right, Yeah. so that's out. So then we get to the point then where um, uh, we, we decide we really need to talk to Al Matthews who is the lead investigator. And uh, when we go through the for, uh, Elections Canada, uh, they're, they're kind of a, I would say they're a secretive organization, but they just, they're not very communicative and they don't like questions from reporters. And, and they're restricted by the act. From, yeah. from their legislation doesn't allow them to be like, oh shit, I should go talk to some reporters. They have to be very fair. So we thought uh, we, could, we could either call up Al Matthews directly and he'd probably hang up on us, but we came up with this idea that we gotta communicate with him on the back channel somehow and signal to him that we want to speak to him. And uh, our moment we saw was that, because this story created a, a bit of a sensation, was the local newspaper on Parliament Hill called the Hill Times was gonna do uh, a profile of Steve and I and about how we got the story. And so they sent a photographer up. So uh, they, they took a picture of us in the hot room. Um, and in the corner of the picture, that's Al Matthews. And we, we thought if he saw this, this would be the bat signal for him to contact us. <laughs> We're still waiting for the call. <laughs> I, I did call uh, Matthews once uh, around this time, and it was a conversation like, uh, hello, Mr. Matthews, this is Steve Mark calling from Post Media News, and I, I wonder, just on background, if there's, we're doing this story, it's going to have, can you just, no, I'm not going to comment, thank you. That's all. So you never got your, your meeting with Al Matthews? Never. We the the never, clue didn't work? Talked to him yet. No. no, a good idea though, you guys are creative. And that's what, you know, that's, that's part of this. I mean, that's part of being an investigative reporter is the creativity that you have to use in finding sources and finding people to talk to, which I think is the most fun, and which I think people are losing these days now with the fact that stuff just gets posted on websites and things. That right. a lot of new young journalists don't know how to do what these guys do. And, it's, and it's, it's a really good skill to know how to do, but when you're just posting stuff on a blog, you're not calling people and figuring out how to get around things. We're a dying breed, I think, print journalists, to tell you the truth. So where does the story go then? Because as I said, you've never figured out who Pierre Poutine is. The charge where the impact of the story has been changes to the Elections Act. Yeah, and but we should but, not but come was, yet. Before we got there, there was a huge blowback against it, right? I Actually, I wonder if there's, there's where the story went after this, is this got coverage all across Canada. And this, I think, was one of the most interesting things about the whole thing, is that 
there were something like 30,000 contacts made to Elections Canada. 30,000 Canadians contacted Elections Canada through some online petition sites and stuff, but many of them, but many of them were also specific founded allegations of dirty political calls. So, and this is what drove me, my interest in it all along, is the idea of some unethical person trying to trick some little old Italian lady in Eglinton Lawrence so that she won't vote, right? That's a, not a very appealing thing to do. And so, and it looked like Elections Canada was not on that. And after our stories, there was so much public pressure that Elections Canada is on that. And they hired a bunch of investigators and they set up this national investigation that continues. We don't know whether it's an effective investigation. We know there is an investigation and there will be some outcome eventually. What about Michael Sonia? What's happened to him? Uh, he's, he continues to d deny that he is Pierre Poutine. He's, he, he says he didn't do it. Uh, he's got a, a court date in June, I think, next year uh, to face these, these charges. It's, it's serious for him. I mean, he's lost his job. Uh, he could go to jail for five years if he was convicted, although there's not a whole lot of history of people being thrown in jail for Elections Act violations. But it's, uh, I mean, I, we're not entirely certain that he acted alone. And I'm not sure Elections Canada is certain that he acted alone either. So uh, we're hoping if he does go to trial, and it sounds like he's going to fight it, uh, that he's going to, we'll find out more about what actually happened there. There's a lot that we don't know. We don't know, and, and I f feel I should make the point that we don't know that there was any kind of a uh, coordinated attempt to discourage people from voting in ridings across Canada. There is evidence that suggests something, somebody was doing something, or some people were doing something in different places, but uh, uh, you can't, I, I've spent, so, we've spent so much time trying to figure it out, you can't do it without subpoena powers and the kind of things that, that Elections Canada has. So you're waiting now for the trial. That, that will be the, the next stage, and, and hopefully there'll be more re revelations there. So before we open, the floor up to, to questions. Just just sum it up in a couple of uh, sentences, Steve, some of the lessons that you learned from this, and then I'll ask Glenn. Uh, one of the things I think that, that uh, we talked about how cooperating is good, I think that two people working together, uh, because creativity is such an important part of investigative journalism, two people, you're going to have more ideas. The, the lesson of this story, as with the, the lesson of the economic action plan story, a uh, key thing, is um, don't, uh, don't give up, keep at it. When they say, no, we're not giving you that information, that's the starting point of, of an interesting investigative project. Uh, another thing is, if you, it's not the easiest thing in the world to, to do investigative journalism professionally. Uh, and in order to, for your stories to be effective, they have to um, be both in the public interest. I mean, you could just, if you want to spend a career putting together slideshows of uh, celebrity bikini bodies, you can maybe make a lot of money, and it's kind of journalism, but uh, the public interest, something that appeals, that people should know about their democracy, but overlapping that with stories that are interesting to the public. And that, that's one of the things that I found, the, the contrast between robocalls and the in-and-out story. And I mean, the in-and-out story was, and there was clear evidence that the most senior officials in the Conservative Party had orchestrated an illegal scheme to circumvent the Elections Act and spend a million dollars more on advertising than any other party. It was clearly illegal. The party fought it and fought it for years and uh, ultimately pled guilty in 2011 uh, after the election. Um, but it never... Uh, it, it was so complicated. It was so complicated. It was one of those and kinds of stories that was really hard to get your head around, whereas this one... Right, and, and in mobile calls, we still don't have that connection to the highest reaches of the party, but it resonates with people, and, and I think the reason it does resonate uh, uh, with so many people is that it confirms their suspicions about the Harper government, even though we don't even know if the Harper government is responsible, but, but they believe it's, it's uh, in their character to do something like this. And it's also a story that people can understand. You know, it's a detective story. Yeah, yeah. people like detective stories. Yeah. And what and what did you take away from this? Uh, yeah, that you got to choose that that, <laughs> that those kinds of factors will make a big difference in 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 uh, how well your story is re is received. The, the other thing that I found really surprising about about doing the robocalls thing was uh, 
uh, having the experience of having the conservative communication apparatus turn on us uh, and start attacking us personally. And, and we've seen this with lots of people who, who cross the conservative government, uh, you know, officials, Linda Keene, and, and you know, who else? There's all kinds of other... Uh, other Manier Sheik. Manier Sheik, the, the, the head of S uh, Statistics Canada. And, and they, they, they don't tolerate that. Uh, when we started doing these robocall stories, suddenly Steve and I uh, were being targeted personally, uh, which was uh, kind of flattering at, at first, and then it got really weird, and, and, and the, the vehicle for it was mostly was, uh, was Sun Media, uh, Nezra Levant, and uh, they would go on and rail about how I used to work at Frank Magazine, so the stories, and this is, I worked at Frank Magazine until 1998, so it was a long, long time ago, and they were saying that, it was an indictment of my credibility. And Dumpster was, divers. Yeah, cool. uh, yeah and, and about the fact that I'd once worked in a strip club when I was going to university, and that was... Not as a dancer. Not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, Graham was a DJ. Yeah, DJ was a cool. uh, And that was, so every time they talked about robocalls, they would mention that oh, this guy who was working with Frank and, and uh, worked in a strip club wrote these stories. And I was 22 at the time when I was doing that, so it was a long time ago. Still sensitive about it. No, no, I'm not. I'm not saying so. That's, that was so weird that they were teasing me about it and never, everybody was tweeting at me saying, oh, that's really cool. It was all right. And they had nothing. But, but they had nothing on Mar. No, well, they did. They, they, and they actually went after Steve in a much more personal way, and a much more vicious way, actually. So, yeah, this is kind of an interesting story. The, um, the Manning Center for Building Democracy, uh, founded by Preston Manning, is an excellent organization that tries to train conservative activists to how to be candidates, how to run election campaigns. And um, they have an annual event in Ottawa where they get together and pat themselves on the back and have uh, policy speeches and so on. Uh, and I, not long after the story broke, was it about a month later, Glenn, I think? Yeah. A, a gang of us went there with our friend and colleague, Andrew Coyne, who was giving a, a speech to them. And uh, so we went for dinner and then we went to this reception that they had which is sort of one of the fun things about being a political reporter in Ottawa, is you basically get to go to receptions all the time if you want to. When something's happening, you show up and they say, oh yeah, okay, come on in. Uh, but not this particular evening. Um, the, uh, some people, organizers asked me to leave. They asked me if I had a pass to be there. After we'd been in there having a glass of wine or two and then this Escorted Mar to retrieve his coat is the, uh, the way they put it. Yeah, yeah. So I and I got angry when they're they're like, can can I see your pass, sir? And I'm like, what are you kicking me out? And they and they say, yes, we're kicking you out. And I got angry and started to swear at the guy, and just not wise. <laughs> Uh, but they, I did. I, I got angry because I thought well, you're kicking me out because of my perfectly legitimate journalistic work. This, that was my impression. I don't really know, and I don't care to find out. It's a misunderstanding, so I get my coat. Um, and then shortly thereafter, that though, they, uh, my uh, friend uh, Ezra Levant from uh, Sun News Network does a big expose on this and does a kind of. Uh, does a telephone interview where I'm trying to get off the phone. It was uh, quite a learning experience in a way to be on the wrong side of a news story. Right. And, and, and the substance of his allegation was that, that you were drunk, which I know from my time at Frank is the one thing you cannot prove about anyone and it's, it's impossible to defend in a defamation suit unless you have breathalyzer results or blood tests or something like that. And, uh, and, he, and you weren't. That was the other thing. No. But, and so this is a psychological challenge when someone is attacking you on television. And I think it's, it's actually a, a great learning experience because you ultimately, you're, you're, it's a very emotional and upsetting thing. This person is attacking me in a way that I consider to be unfair. And then, you know, you work it through and you, and you get attacked again. And ultimately, you realize it really doesn't matter. It just is not a big deal. And thinking about it, obsessing about it, it's like, well, it's just a waste of time. And that's how Ezra feels about things, too. He will say that as long as his face is on television and he's talking, that's great. It doesn't matter if, he, or if people are talking about him. I mean, that's his approach, too. But I do have to point out that you, in your 10, your ten points about uh, how to do investigative reporting, you say professional cordial relationships is useful for both sides. So you shouldn't have sworn at that little Tory. No, no, I shouldn't have. I should have said, oh, you'd like me to leave? 
Well, I apologize. I hope that everything's, yeah, no, that was wrong, and uh, All right, I regret the misunderstanding. <laughs> okay, on that note, let's, let's take some questions, and we'll take some questions on, uh, on Twitter as well. I think they're going to be given to me, and anybody who has questions, there's a, a mic set up over there, and if you could just approach the mic and, uh, and ask some questions. There's also, um, we can talk about uh, Pamela Wallen and uh, Mike Duffy, if anybody's interested in what's happening in the Senate and what's been happening in the Senate today. I know that Steve has written a column for tomorrow's paper about the, uh, about the Senate situation. So there's, uh, there's lots of news uh, to be had in Ottawa today. All right. And I'll be waiting for questions on, uh, on Twitter as well. Stephen, I'm glad you uh, demysticized how you gather, uh, you know, the the uh, deep throat sources about just calling people, not cold calling, it's the people you know casually in the political world. Because I had the same experience when I was chasing a story about a premier in this province and his sexual activities, and I just simply called everybody that I knew casually because in a in a city. A capital city like Halifax, there's a lot of people from all over the province. You don't have to make long distance phone calls. I had no money. But I just knew that eventually I would get cover the entire province because people would say, my sister knew about what he was up to back in, in Stellarton. But it was amazing how terrifying it was to the other side because people always talk. And eventually, the fact that I was just calling hundreds of people got back to a much bigger organization than, than a single individual. And, uh, you know, it, it was intimidating for them because they, they couldn't be sure who was the Mike Duffy among their friends, who was the guy who couldn't stop talking. So that's all you have to do, just call people. It's not expensive. It's not terrifying because you know them casually. You know, you're not, as a young journalist, you're just calling people you've met once or twice and someone will eventually talk. I often find that in Ottawa, it's, and uh, I think Jane probably uh, would agree, uh, there's not many journalists I, that I know who are better at working sources than Jane. Uh, it's often a question of who do you already know? The relationships with people, there's loads of people who know things that they wouldn't mind reading in the newspaper, but they expose themselves when they talk to a journalist. And in order for them to do that, they must know and trust you. And a lot of what I spend my time thinking about, and it's not a simple thing, but is how can I be a trustworthy reporter so that if people give me information, they'll know that it will never ever, and I often say things like, it's my ambition in life to go to jail for refusing to reveal a source, and I commit to you that I will spend up to two weeks in prison. <laughs> After that, you're likely out of luck, but uh, two weeks, I'll do that much time. At the same time, though, it's important to, uh, to make sure that you're not their friend. You have to realize that, uh, you know what, it, it's a contract. They, they need you as much as you need them. In fact, they need you more than you need them, as, 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 uh, as Glenn and Steve have, have shown, that when you're shut out by, by the PMO in a way that these conservatives are so good at doing, that there's other ways of getting information, and you just have to sort of go around and figure it out. But at the same time, though, you are not you are not their friend and at the end of the day you could just discard them you have to be ruthless about it you could just discard them you have to know that and i think if you know that you're a much better journalist well, one of the things i remember david bentley telling me when i was in the early days of, of working for him at frank was uh, and i was having a lot of i was in my mid-20s and i was not doing all that well i was getting stories here and there but uh i, I wasn't you know breaking anything big and he said you're going to have to wait about 20 years when uh, the people that you know, your contemporaries, move into positions of power. Because the contemporaries you have now are in fairly menial jobs and they don't, n don't know a whole lot. So that makes a huge difference. But to the point of, of calling as many people as you can, uh, a lot of it is, is work ethic. And, and the, 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 you know, the guy I think is the best reporter on Parliament Hill is Bob Fife. Uh, and he's got incredible sources, but he comes in every morning and just starts calling people, one after another after another. Very few reporters do that. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking to each person, I'm told. Yeah. Sources tell me that he <laughs> says, hi, oh, it's Bob Fife here. Do you know who the next governor of the Bank of Canada is going to be? No? Uh, okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Next call. <laughs> I think he's a little bit more finesse than that. I worked, I worked for Bob for a while, and I think that, uh, <laughs> that Steve, Steve's... Uh, I'm likely exaggerating, yeah, and I don't know. And, yeah, exactly. Um, go ahead. 
Um, yeah, congratulations for the work you've been doing. Um, the biggest surprise to me is that it appears in the Ottawa Citizen. Every Christmas I go to visit relatives and it's an astoundingly bad paper editorially, but I find in terms of the slant and the picture and who they own, I just find it's quite, I mean, this is from somebody who's used to the Herald. So um, anyway, I, 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 what, I'm, what I'm commenting no, I'm on is... I'm not going to stipulate to that, but continue. <laughs> no, no, but I, um, in terms of the columnists and the editorial slant, not the reporting, the stories per se, but um, because I think it's quite critical to, to what kind of support you might get. Um, the people you talk to may not be your friends, but they're the publisher's friends or they're the board of directors of the paper's friends. I remember years ago working for, this, for covering City Hall and I was just starting to get a sense that the various people might talk to me just because I wasn't getting the information presented at council wrong. I wasn't any great person. All I did, if somebody said that the building is eight feet long, I said it was eight feet long. And so eventually, but then I ran a story that said <coughs> that they were considering view planes legislations way outside of Halifax in uh, Coal Harbor. Well, it happened that the Herald building was located, well, it's where that big hole in the ground is now, but the view planes legislation was of great sensitivity to the owners of the Herald because it, it would determine the value of that property. And the next day I was on the desk, I never reported again. And so this was not an investigative piece. This was something that came up at council and I just reported it. And so. The, the, the idea that you can make one story and then you're right off the beat, the, that, that's, that's a concern, I think, in terms of what level of support can so-called investigative journalists um, get from their employers when somebody's, if you're stepping on anybody really important, it, it toes. And the second point is, in terms of, uh, you mentioned, uh, in terms of the new information about what CSEC and other groups are doing in terms of tracking everybody's calls, what are the chances that you guys can operate without somebody knowing everybody you're calling and the people you're calling know everybody you're calling? It's not, it's not science fiction anymore. We know what they're doing in the States and so forth. And I wonder what kind of chilling, or chilling a atmosphere that will have when, when people don't have any sense that their calls um, are secret. And I refer to what a, an excellent piece on Glenn Greenwald and um, uh, the, the woman's name escapes me in terms of the level of, of, of what's the term, in, that they have to encode in everything, every email, it's all encrypt. It's, encrypt. It's spectacular. I really recommend every student here to read that article because it, it's at a very sophisticated level. Mind you, they're taken on the United States government, but I think in this day and age, it, it, I wonder what effect, well, the, the technology helps investigative journalists, how much you're going to be under the, not just you, but under the gun when it's quite easy to find out who you are, you guys are calling. Did you guys time. ever feel any chilling effect at all from, from, your, from the employers? No, and that's something that uh, Post Media and the Ottawa Citizen, uh, th if they ever received messages from pe powerful people in politics or powerful people in the business world, uh, they never told us. Which, uh, and, and they supported the stories. They, uh, and you can't do good investigative journalism unless you have work for a professional news organization that is going to back you up. I, I think it's very difficult. You can maybe, you know, you can have your own blog and, and do things, but uh, if your employer doesn't believe in it, very difficult. Uh, to the point of security and encryption, I mean, we, people were very nervous about talking to us, uh, especially once the story had broken and we were trying to keep it going. And I had, one, I had one experience where I would convinced a, a pretty senior uh, conservative uh, strategist to have coffee with me at Starbucks uh, on Bank Street in downtown Ottawa. And um, we sat there and he was, he was very nervous and he kept looking around. And finally he, he just jumped up in mid-question and said, let's go. And we got out on the street and he said, are you taping me? Was that guy ne sitting next to us taping me? I go, what? And he goes, there was this heavy set gentleman there who, who was holding his cell phone at a very weird angle. And I was like, uh, no. It was, and it was very strange. And I realized then that there was that fear on their side, but the fear wasn't, they were, they were just worried about being caught and, and being fingered as a source for us when actually this guy actually didn't really have that much information. It was not, not all that useful. The CSE and NSA uh, metadata stuff is worrying. I talked to a former spy about this a while ago, 
uh, if I, I the way one of the ways I deal with this is um, uh, having the most sensitive conversations in person, where they're you're not going to be recorded. And I like to to, to meet sources in person and talk to them. Um, but a retired spy told me that the government, and I think this is right, that the CSE, NSA may be recording things, and but there, uh, uh, I don't. You need a judicial order to get a wiretap. For you know, they would have to basically fill out an ITO and go to a judge and say, "We believe that Glenn McGregor is operating a, uh, you know, a strip club." That's right. <laughs> So it's not like, to my knowledge, political actors can't call up CSIS or CSC and say, the chief of staff of the prime minister, if, the, if he called up CSIS and said, I'd like to see Glenn McGregor's phone records, I would like to think that the director of CSIS would say, no, that's not appropriate, that's not in my legislation. Uh, to the point about communications, this, uh, this government is... Uh is so paranoid about communicating with journalists that everything now seems to be an email so that they can't, you can't engage them in a conversation so that they could inadvertently say something. So everything is, is, is scripted in an email, which is great if you're on deadline because you can just sort of cut and paste it into your story, but it's not really, it's not really journalism. And one of the things that I noticed when I moved here was there, there were fewer filters. I mean, the filters are there, but they're not the same kind of filters that you see in Ottawa. I remember trying to get a, 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 an official in government here thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to have to phone the press secretary and say this, and then wait, and then they'll ask me what my deadline is, and then they'll say, what are your questions? Because that's what you have to do in Ottawa now. And the guy answered the phone, and I was like, ooh, like I didn't really know what to do. I was expecting that I had my story done by noon, and it was unbelievable I mean, how things go here. But you can see that a lot of the governments now are taking the Harper approach. We saw that in Ontario with Dalton McGinty. We saw that a little bit here with the Dexter government. Uh, Daryl Dexter was really, really really intrigued by Harper's communications and the PMO. And when I would meet with, with Mr. Dexter, he would ask me about that, how things worked and how many questions and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and you can see that other governments are trying to take that approach because they think it works. You know, just stick to the message, don't say anything else, and don't veer off topic. Twitter I have no Twitter questions. Uh -huh. So we're hoping for some students. Yes, here we go. Hi, Jane. Hello. Uh, this is for all three of you. I just have spoken with Jane in the past few weeks, so I thought I'd this say hi. This would be hi. the editor of the Dalhousie newspaper. Yes, I am. But my question, you gave the teaser, so I'll take the bait. Can we talk about the Senate? What's the question? I want to hear your takes on it, on the coverage of it, and where you think it's going to go. Uh, I did a story t uh, for tomorrow's paper. Um, about, I have a source saying that a Conservative Party lawyer, Arthur Hamilton, who is the, the guy who's handled the defense for the party on the robocall story, is, uh, his name features in the emails when the deal was being, uh, the emails that Mike Duffy has, uh, where the deal was being set up, and further that his law firm handled the transfer of money from uh, Nigel Wright to uh, Mike Duffy's lawyer which, if it's proven, would be interesting because Mr. Harper's defense of this, uh, of the whole thing, has been that this was um, uh, Nigel Wright acting on his own. That was the initial, and that the knowledge of it wasn't spread that widely. If the party's lawyer was involved and had knowledge of this, then that's another reporting channel opened up to Harper. So it's, it raises questions. But I think Glenn, who did the first story about Mike Duffy's housing expenses, might have a... Uh, yeah, I did, I did a story last year about, about uh, Duffy's um, expenses and... And, and actually, Harp. And, Harp and Harp, well. Harp's expenses. That was the next day. Um, and Duffy came out and said it was payback uh, because he had sued Frank at one point, uh, which was totally a bizarre allegation because we'd worked together in the hot room for, for many, many years. Uh, and, and that was, it, it was kind of like the acorn of the story, and uh, I didn't, there was other reporters who did a lot more work on this story since, uh, Jordan Press at, at our company, and, uh, and Bob Fife, obviously, who broke open the, uh, the story about the payment from Nigel Wright, and, you know, I think it's, 
like it's almost a Shakespearean uh, situation where where the, the same story uh, for different governments repeats over and over again. And I mean, Watergate was, uh, you know, uh, uh, described famously as, as a second-rate burglar gone wrong uh, that brought down the president of the United States. And it's not going to be Mike Duffy's housing expenses and whether he actually lives in this cottage in PEI or someplace on a golf course out in the west end of Ottawa. Uh, it, it's, it's shown a light on the way the government approaches uh, issues management, is what they call it corporately, and um, every day and how it seems is a new development that shows things that they have done to try and make this go away in the interest of political expediency that were not, clearly not ethical and probably quite possibly illegal including today when Senator Brazo uh, stood up in the uh, Senate and said that uh, the, the government, the, the top conservative in the, in the Senate approached him um, privately and said, if you would just uh, apologize and admit wrongdoing, well, we'll make sure you're not going to be penalized and you probably you might be able to keep your job in the Senate, right? Which is, you know, it's just one in a long string of ham-handed attempts that the, the government has made to, to try and make this go away and I think it's going to get worse for them because there's an RCMP investigation and everything is, if, if they actually lay charges and there's going to be a trial, all this, uh, all the emails, uh, all the interviews, uh, it's all going to come out and we're going to, I think we're going to see a lot more about it. We've only seen so far little drips and drabs and it's all been driven by really good investigative reporting by a lot of different reporters, but I think, uh, you know, the tools we have as reporters are limited. Uh, compared to what the police have. They can subpoena documents, they can force people to, to, to testify and give evidence, um, and they can obtain bank records and file ITOs. So uh, once, once it gets there, I think that's really going to be, uh, that's really going to be dramatic too if it goes to trial. If they do their jobs. I think they will. They still they seem pretty yeah, I think they have to do their jobs, yeah. We'll see. Hi there. Thank you all for your talk tonight. Um, I know that you've spoken about your the differences in your approaches to investigative journalism and how that has been helpful in your collaborative process. But can you speak a little bit to times where that has been a little bit more of a challenge or a barrier in your work together? It's a stump. It's a stumper. I know. I know. <laughs> we, we actually, we don't really uh, argue much. It's weird. Ever? Uh, uh, no, it's, uh, we get, uh, we'll, have to, we'll, we'll disagree sometimes about the best way to approach a particular thing, but, but usually we come around to a common view. I think our differences are good because Steve tends to be more, like he, he, uh, he, he will pursue a theory much more aggressively and I'll be the, the I, I kind of think of us as like Oscar and Felix. Uh, and I would be Felix and he would be Oscar. Uh, that, oh, that's totally lost on all you people. You have no <laughs> idea what I'm talking about, right? Maybe some of the older folks would, would remember that. It's a better uh, Beavis and Butthead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I think it, uh, yeah, we, it, it, it's, it's worked okay. We have, we've never had any kind of like major disagreements about it. Um, and, and we act as a foil to one another and it's been okay. There's, um, you mentioned the theory thing. That's something I think about a lot. And, uh, and I think it's a useful process for investigative journalism. You think about, uh, there's a concept in, uh, there's a great book by a guy named Robert McKee called Story, about st story structure and what kind of stories work. Uh, it's mainly for screenwriters, but we're in the business of telling stories. It's, we, we can focus so much on the challenges in trying to acquire information, but if it's going to succeed, it will succeed because it's a story that is interesting to people. And he has the concept of the gap, the gap between what we expect reality is and what reality actually is. And that, that, that every good story, whether it's a detective story or a love story or something, there is, you open up a gap or you, and ultimately close it between the way people think the world is and the way that it actually is. Uh, and I, I find that a, a pitfall that I have to watch out for and is pursuing a theory, knowing when to abandon a theory, right? So my theory was somebody was monkeying around in the last election. That turned out to be right, and there was a gap there, I think, it looks like. Uh, but it's a, a huge mistake, and you should constantly, particularly with political stories, it's a huge mistake to give your, the evidence in front of you too much weight, and to be on the side of the prosecution, and to assume that there are many people in on some conspiracy, 
And to try, so I always am trying to think like, well, could this be just a, a very small operation? Could this, you know, how, could this just be isolated? I think that that kind of thing is, is very useful because you don't want to be wearing a tinfoil hat. You don't want to be, walk, be you know, walking around assuring people that you've uncovered the greatest conspiracy when there is no great conspiracy. Um, I just wanted to go back to something that was said around the beginning uh, about stories that are only interesting to accountants. Um, I'm not an accountant, didn't do particularly well in math class, and I feel like that's kind of something I hear a lot from uh, journalism students. Um, I guess my question is, uh, how do we sort of close that gap and turn numbers into stories, and what are some ways that we can sort of learn how to get a hold of numbers because I feel like there's often a lot of stories lost there um, and things can be hidden quite easily uh, by shuffling numbers around. So I guess the question is how do we make, how do we make that work? Well, I think, Lens, you make numbers sexy with, uh, with, with trying to, uh, with the patterns that you do. And I remember one story in the Ottawa Citizen uh, talking about the parking meters. I love that story. And that was, that was kind of a money story. Yeah, well, but it was I, sexy. I talked to Fred's master's class about that today. We, we, we did this thing where we went and got uh, uh, all, all the records for every parking ticket issued in Ottawa over a five-year period. And it, if you look at it, it's just a long list of numbers and infractions, and it's kind of boring. Uh, but what you have to do is you analyze it and you look for trends and then one of the trends we spotted was that there was a lot of parking tickets being issued around hospitals. So I went out to uh, the, one of the hospitals in the East End and I found this woman who uh, had uh, got a parking ticket that day and she had been in a coma for three days and had just come back to the hospital to make sure she was okay. She, she didn't hail some uh, cleaning solvents or something. and. Uh, she was not a wealthy woman and she saw this $30 ticket and she was crushed because she was so excited that she was going to go out and have a, a hamburger at Harvey's that day to celebrate the fact she had gotten the all clear. So if you can find somebody who exemplifies what the numbers are showing, that's how you make it a, a story that has an expression of emotional valence. Uh, I was at a journalism conference once in, in, uh, in uh, Boston and they, and they talked about uh, how your story is more effective if you have a higher emotional valence. And at one end of the, this, the spectrum of emotional valence is children who are, whose lives are in immediate jeopardy of violent death, and at the other end was so Soviet agricultural statistics. So you've got to find some way of getting it in there. Quick point on that. The, uh, sometimes you got to sort through a lot of numbers to do a story. The amount of numbers, I thought my vision was going to fail during the economic action plan stuff, just days and days of databasing. But in the end, it's not really a story about numbers. It's a story about politicians putting rinks in Tory ridings, because that's where, you know, which is probably not the way the world should work, right? So it's just, it doesn't really, you, you have to sort through a lot of numbers, but you don't have to put a lot of numbers in your story. Okay, I, I have a Twitter question. Can we just, uh, can you guys just answer this? This is from Ryan Ross in 140 characters. When you guys team up, how much does each of you contribute to the actual writing? Who does what? I think I do most of it. <laughs> we actually wrote all our stories in Google Docs, uh, uh, so we, which have the, the unique uh, quality of that we could both edit it simultaneously, so I could see what Steve was writing. And, and a lot of times when we were working on a really tight deadline, because we thought a competitor had the same uh, information, we would both be writing different parts of the story at exactly the same time. So I could see his cursor was uh, pink and mine was blue, and uh, you know we would see the, the text coming together. And we could also would exchange little snarky remarks uh, at each other as well while we were writing. And, uh, so we, it was yeah, pretty clever. So some, uh, we had some stories. Uh, we kind of developed a practice for a while where we were double bylining everything. Uh, so there were stories w with very few words written by one of us. There were basically stories written by one person, but the, the project was a double byline project. Okay. Hi. Uh, I was hoping Mr. Steele would still be here. Especially when we were talking about numbers, I noticed he left too. Well, be no, because he would also have a personal experience of 
the Economic Action Plan, whereas my personal experience was as a member of the Dartmouth City Council when it was when an EAP was called Infrastructure Plan. And I took great exception to uh, Mr. Maher's article at the time, at the recent one that he wrote about the EAP. Let me give you an, an example of what really goes on when these decisions are made. So supposedly, an infrastructure plan is, is split three ways, federal, provincial, municipal. Well, I can tell you that 20 years ago on the council, we had a list of priorities that we submitted for monies for the infrastructure plan. Well, that was really a waste of time for two reasons, because number one, the MP had his list of priorities and the province had their list of priorities. Well, actually, the person that calls the shots is the MP that is number one in the province or the area. At that time, that was Dave Dingwall. Dave Dingwall had backed John Cretien for years, whereas our MP in Dartmouth had backed Paul Martin. So he was relegated, and at the same time, Dingwall was making all the decisions as to what got funded and what didn't get funded. And if the province didn't sign off on the money that he wanted for Cape Breton University, nothing else was going to get funded until that was signed off. At the same time, I was on the board of Neptune when we were trying to build a new theater, and that was still held up because Savage and Dingwall were at loggerheads over how the money would be spent. Round about, I think it was 93, 94, when the G45 was in Halifax. So we had a list of about 30 projects in Dartmouth that we wanted. And at the bottom was the Peace Monument. But what happened was, the foreign ministers wanted to do something in Dartmouth. And they thought, so somebody must have told them, there's this proposal for a Peace Monument. And that's where $400,000 of infrastructure money went over all sorts of other much more important items. And I think not many people really, re unless you're in there, when all this bargaining is going back and forth, and here you are thinking, well, I've got a third of the dollars, so I get a third of the sea. Throw that out the window. And if you remember the library here, that initially Premier Dexter wasn't keen to fund it. And somehow or other, I was hoping Mr. Steele would be here, he, somehow or other he was pressured into putting his third up. But I'll, I'll move on to, a, on to a, a different story. Halifax, a number of years ago, gave it, its pension plan gave over $40 million to State Street Canada, a subsidiary of State Street Boston. And unbeknownst to them, they immediately handed it to Bernie Madoff. So you can imagine where, what happened. They subsequently sued. And that was reported, I think, at first by Paul Withers. The settlement was reached in June this year between HRM Pension Plan and State Street Canada. And apparently the terms of the settlement require that no information whatsoever be divulged by either party. So as journalists wanting to do a story about how $44 million disappeared into the ether, how would you approach that, considering that both parties apparently have agreed to be silent? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, when we did the economic action plan stories that would include projects of that kind, we were looking at the entire country in aggregate, and we were hoping to show, uh, or hoping to determine whether or not there was any kind of political favoritism that would be revealed by the patterns that the numbers showed. And I mean, for every case like those that you have explained, there could be other uh, information anecdotal that would present a different opinion. So that's where dealing with large amounts of numbers and, and thousands and thousands of projects, our approach was to look at, at, look at it as a, as a, rather than at the project level, but 
the to look at that as a, a statistical analysis of a of a countrywide program with billions of dollars at stake. And that, I mean, that that would that might have been a great story for the Herald to go in and dig down and find out what happened there. But it the wasn't Herald really did do a lot of work on on Dingwall spending at the time, and and uh, Bill Casey, Highway Bill Casey, accused him of basically stealing the, the highway. The, the, there's a toll road between Nova Scotia and uh, New Brunswick, and uh, the, there was federal money earmarked for that that instead ended up building a, uh, a highway to nowhere in Cape Breton. Okay, and there's, uh, I think, a big new wellness center in uh, New Glasgow, which would be Peter McKay's riding, and I think the Cape Bretoners are complaining about that, so everybody gets their turn depending on which government yeah. is in office, so it kind of works itself out in, in, in the long run. On that note, I want to thank everybody for, for coming, and I want to thank Steve Marr, Glenn McGregor for participating tonight and for their wonderful work on the, on the robocall story. You guys, have been a real treat, so thank you very much. And I forgot one thing. Uh, Steve is reading from his political thriller, Deadline, at Economy Shoe Shop at 7 p.m. on Sunday. Amy Smith is uh, the host, and Highway Bill Casey is going to be there as well, I He's think. going to an event in Truro on Tuesday. Oh, he's going to be in Truro. I'm sorry, I misread the article in the paper about Steve today. Sorry. So if you haven't had enough, you can come on Sunday to the Economy Shoe Shop. And I think uh, we're going to go to the wardroom now. So if anyone wants to come and say hi, we'll uh, have a, a glass of sherry there. <laughs> All right, so that's a wonderful start. And thanks very much, uh, you guys, for a really interesting panel, very insightful. And I learned a few things that I had no idea about. So that's fantastic. And so um, that's a great start to the Joseph House Symposium. And uh, really only the beginning, because uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30, we're back, and uh, Suzanne Reber from the Center for Investigative Reporting in California will be here to talk about the sort of digital revolution in investigative reporting. And then later on in the day, uh, we're going to hear from uh, uh, Tim Bosquet from the Coast, who's over here, uh, about his story uh, uh, about uh, former Mayor Peter Kelly. And, and we'll wrap up the day with a panel on where does investigative journalism go from here. So thanks everybody for coming out tonight and we'll see you all uh, tomorrow morning and those who watched uh, live on the stream, uh, we'll be back tomorrow morning at 9.30. Thanks so much. <laughs>